Good midday, afternoon in Europe, um, or morning, or um, good night, wherever you are, and now looking at us. Now the journey continues to Canada. I'm your co-moderator, Lorena. I'm a Spanish, dark-haired woman with a long dress and black sandals, and some um, lipstick on my face that hopefully stays only on the lips and nowhere else because of the masks that just change our makeup the whole time. Um, and as I said, the journey continues to Canada with our next speaker, which is Professor uh, Wendy Hu Kyung Chun. Um, she is a professor that holds a prestigious Canada 150 research chair position in new media at the Digital Democracies Institute on, of the Simon Fraser University. Chun's research focuses on breaking down barriers to solve the most pressing issues of our time around discrimination and democracy. Her background is the epitome of interdisciplinarity. It is almost a contestation to the academic world of disciplinary niche. It draws from her academic education in systems design engineering and media and literacy studies to investigate the rise of computers as networked media and spans the fields of new media studies, global and comparative media studies, media archaeology, um, gender and sexuality studies, software studies, science and technology studies, digital humanities, critical race theory, and critical data studies. And indeed, we need all of these disciplines to ponder on the social dimension of these technologies we're discussing um, within these three days of the festival. She has been awarded fellowships in the most prestigious academic institutes and universities. And today, we have the privilege to get a sneak preview of a new book, Discriminating Data, which will be published in autumn. Um, the keynote is pre-recorded and I've listened to it and my, my advice is that you better fasten your seatbelts. It's fire. And Wendy will be with us live for a Q&A afterwards. Any questions that you want to ask her, can, as usual, be directed to the phone number appearing in the stream, which is plus 49177-6904-295. And if you want to place a question here and on site, please just step to the microphone. Thank you. And over to you, Wendy. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here, wherever here is for you. I'm Wendy Higyang Chun, and I'm Simon Fraser University's Canada 150 Chair in New Media and Director of the Digital Democracies Institute. I have red glasses, dark brown eyes, rather round cheeks, uh, and long black hair peppered with some unruly white hair that sort of stick out in all directions. Um, I'm in my living room in Vancouver, and since my sweetheart tends to roam around, I have a virtual background of Simon Fraser University up. Um, some of you might recognize these buildings. Our campus was Caprica in the most recent Battlestar Galactica series. Um, so we're living in so many ways in the midst of an apocalypse. My apartment in a freakishly hot Vancouver lies on the unceded traditional coast Salish lands, including the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam nations. I thank the members of these nations and their ancestors for caring for this land and for tolerating my presence on it. I acknowledge and respect their research and knowledge of land, relationality and machines. And I also acknowledge the violence and destruction that settler colonialism has brought and still brings. And I'm so glad that this festival in part takes on this legacy in hopes of creating a different present and future. Um, and what a wonderful festival. It's an honor to speak alongside experts on indigenous AI with whom um, and from whom I continue to learn. Um, 
And I'm very sad not to be there in person, um, especially since I have such fond memories of the Hamburg region. I spent a happy year um, in Lunenburg with the Digital Cultures Research Lab. Um, and today I'll address the future of code politics by giving you all a sneak preview of my book, Discriminating Data, which is coming out this November. And my book speaks directly to the conference theme. To remind you of it, um, the organizers write, uh, these technologies form infrastructures that form our lives for the future and sustainably determine the conditions of our societies. They have a massive impact on social systems, policies, societal processes, and our coexistence as communities. They create new realities and entrench old structures that we thought had long been abolished. Um, they create new realities and entrench old structures that we thought had long been abolished. And today I'll reveal that this entrenchment isn't accidental for these technologies threaten to turn the and between new realities and entrenched old structures into an equal sign. That is they threaten to make new realities equal entrenched old structures so that the future disappears into a dystopic vision of the past. So to make this clear, let's start with a collective thought experiment. Okay, so everyone, imagine or recall images or sounds of a mythic um, and deeply flawed past. Um, so I'll supply a few. Here's uh, uh, the so-called uh, perfect white suburban nuclear family um, imagined by Hollywood, um, living in a segregated planned community in which everything is the same. So here's Levittown, which was built um, post-World War II. Um, and here's Lena, um, the Playboy centerfold come test image that as Dylan um, Mulvin has argued lies at the heart of modern image processing. And here are the images of US celebrities, which are the training ground for many facial recognition systems. So imagine that this deep fake past has become the only past. Then imagine a world in which nothing could change from this deep fake past. So imagine a world and nothing could change from this deep, deep fake past because learning and truth equals repeating this past. Do you have that? What you've just imagined or heard is the world of machine learning. A world that we need to use Ariella Azulai's term to unlearn that we need to unlearn by refusing the current earth-destroying politics of code, that we need to unlearn by living with what remains, by living with what remains both inside and outside our machine. Um, and this need drives my new book, Discriminating Data. So most broadly, Discriminating Data reveals how data analytics and machine learning create agitated clusters of comforting rage by encoding legacies of eugenics, segregation, and discrimination. Um, by taking on these issues, discriminating data is in dialogue with many recent books and articles written by Kathy O'Neill, Sophia Noble, Ruha Benjamin, Meredith Broussard, Kate Crawford, Virginia Eubanks, and so many others. Um, and discriminating data follows the following five-step program. Step one is to expose and investigate how ignoring differences amplifies discrimination. So, as the current and past histories of the internet and machine learning make clear, ignoring race ignorantly promotes racism. And every day we seem to hear a new instance of what Kathy O'Neill has called weapons of math destruction, 
what Sophia Noble has called algorithms of oppression and what Ruha Benjamin has called the new Jim Code. Um, from discriminatory predictive policing and risk assessment programs to unfair hiring programs. Um, and the classic example of this, which almost everybody mentions, is Compass. Right? So for those of you unfamiliar with Compass, Compass is a software program used by some US courts to predict the risk of recidivism and thus by some to determine both sentencing and parole. And it's been shown to be biased against racial minorities. And it's been sued for discrimination, um, although not yet successfully. And you, here you see the cover of an award-winning ProPublica article on Compass. The problem, as Anna Maria Barry Jester, Ben Kesselman, and Dana Goldstein have shown in their analysis of the Marshall Project, is that Although Compass doesn't overtly use racial categories, it uses categories that are proxies for race or racism in the United States. Um, so it asks people to fill out a questionnaire. And here you see how race is linked to factors such as man with no high school degree and signal and don't have a job. And again, these are arguably more proxies for racism rather than race. Now, some data scientists have argued that these factors aren't as important as others. Um, and apparently age and dirty data play a larger role than these um, proxies. But this doesn't quite exonerate Compass because in the United States, given the over and under policing of certain neighborhoods, dirty data and age at time of arrest are proxies for racism. Crucially, Compass was initially sold as solving the problem of racism by eradicating individual bias. Um, so this program was initially introduced during the late years of the Obama era. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised that it failed so miserably. Rewriting political and social problems as one's technology can and should solve never goes well. This hopeful ignorance isn't new. And hopeful ignorance relies on a long and ableist history of blindness, so-called blindness, and on its flip side lie exhausting dreams of sovereignty and servitude, if not slavery. It's no accident that surveillance devices are sold as modern day servants and that this framing inevitably provokes fears of them as evil masters. Um, it's like Hegel never died. Um, that these fears and dreams are, as Jenny Re pointed out, profoundly raced and gendered. And discriminating data argues that these two sides of hopeful ignorance need to be taken on together. Because the best way to avoid an AI apocalypse is to treat everyone and everything with respect. To follow the Kumbahi River Collective's call to treat everyone as levelly human by engaging, not ignoring, identity politics. And to follow Jason Edward Lewis's, Nolani Arista, Archer Pachawis's, and Suzanne Kite's call for us to make kin with our machines. For freedom is only freedom if it's freedom for all. And as the successful struggles against facial recognition technology have shown us, civil rights and civil liberties are interlinked, not opposed. Um, these movements are best when put together. Uh, step number two is to interrogate default assumptions and axioms that ground algorithms and data structures. So in the book, I look at correlation, homophily, authenticity, and recognition. Um, for example, I reveal how overblown promises about correlation tie early 21st century data analytics 
to early 20th century eugenics. Um, as many of you I'm sure are aware, correlation drives um, the era of big data. Correlation makes data the new oil. Correlation, we've been told, changes everything. Um, Kukier and uh, Meyer Schonenberger, for example, have argued that by allowing us to address the entire data set, big data moves us from the why to the how. Theory's dead because causality is dead. Instead of causes, we have actually existing correlations proxies for certain behaviors that enable us to predict and possess the future rather than the past. Maybe. But if knowledge now means knowing the future, it's because in these models, the past and the future coincide. Structurally speaking, the past and the future are the same things in these models. The future and the past are missing, but recreatable values. So consider this description of link prediction. What's key here is that the future T plus one is determined in the same way as missing information in the past. The likely future equals the missing past. Um, machine learning algorithms are trained and tested using existing data. In fact, the ground truth is a highly selective so-called cleaned past, not the future. And this means that if the so-called cleaned past is racist, then these models will make racist predictions. Or more starkly, if the past is racist, they'll only be verified as correct if they make racist predictions. This is the most undisruptive version of the future possible. So in this future, there can be no disruption. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised because correlation was developed as a tool to prove the truth of 20th century eugenics. This isn't correlation's first rodeo. And here you see Carl Pearson's celebration of correlation in the early 20th century. And Pearson um, was a eugenicist and he's considered to be the father of modern statistics. And his words could easily be confused with those of early 21st century proselytizers of big data. And Pearson and Sir Francis Galton developed correlation to determine what stays the same from generation to generation and to shape the future by manipulating these so-called unchanging traits, um, such as for them criminality. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that everybody who uses correlation is a eugenicist. Um, Correlation is important for many models such as global climate change models. Um, but rather what I'm saying is that if the world seems so closed, it's because these tools were designed to close rather than to open the future. They were supposed to prove that learning, that nurture, that lasting cultural change was impossible. So according to Pearson, Correlation was crucial to proving that intelligence couldn't be created. It could only be bred. So it's truly perverse that machine learning draws from concepts developed to show that learning was impossible. In addition, I show how homophily, the notion that similarity breeds connection, ties social networks to US residential segregation. So our current social networks presume that birds of a feather flock together, which means that echo chambers aren't an accident, they're the goal. Um, in fact, as I'll discuss uh, more later, the very term homophily comes from studies of post-World War II residential segregation. Um, and more precisely from white residents' feelings about living in biracial public housing projects. Digital uh, um, 
discriminating data also looks at how authenticity, how slight deviations and transgressions um, grounds training and transparency. That is how we become predictable, not by rationally following norms, but by deviating slightly from them with others, by embracing and producing rather than disavowing stigma. Um, and lastly, it looks at how recognition from facial recognition technology to the radical rights embrace of the new, a new politics of recognition is founded on discrimination. And through this, I show how social media networks launder hate into love, right? So how do you prove homophily? How do you show you love the same? By fleeing and repelling others when they show up. Um, social media networks create networks by magnetizing and disintegrating masses, by divining and amplifying perceived stigma, and then consolidating these angry clusters around a common enemy, um, such as so-called social justice warriors. This is hegemony formed in reverse. Um, so if hegemony once entails creating a majority by various minorities accepting and identifying with a dominant worldview, majorities now often emerge by consolidating angry clusters <clears throat> through their opposition to mainstream culture, which makes the norm never become a normie. Um, and the goal of this hegemonic clustering is decidedly non-normative from Fox News broadcasters who rail against the mainstream media, even though Fox News is the most popular channel on basic cable in the United States, um, to Silicon Valley Saurons who view themselves as underdogs. And crucially, driving this consolidation is a powerful and poisonous liberation envy. And through this liberation, Racial envy, the radical right disidentifies with and against civil rights heroes. So as Cynthia Young has pointed out, Martin Luther King and other civil rights figures have been taken up by white supremacists. Step number three is to apprehend the past, present and future machine learning puts in place, focusing on when, why and how the predictions work. What's key again is that in machine learning, truth equals consistency, the future equals the past. Um, so as Adrian McKenzie um, has told us, learning is comprehensively understood in machine learning as finding a mathematical function that could have generated the data and optimizing the search for that function as much as possible. So learning is optimized that is parsimonious repetition. That's the problem with machine learning as it currently exists, isn't simply that it's often trained on dirty or highly selective data. Again, Hollywood celebrities lie at the heart of many facial recognition technology training sets. And here you see so-called deep fakes, which are produced using the set. Um, the problem isn't simply, as this example makes clear, that ground truth equals deep fake, but also again, that these so-called predictive programs are verified as true only if they reproduce this data. So in these models, truth equals consistent repetition. And this matters because these programs aren't simply predictive, they're performative. So risk assessment software like Compass cement and amplify inequalities through their decisions. Reducing truth to consistent repetition forecloses the present, past, and future. Again, these programs are disruptive if they are, not because they make possible unforeseen, unknown worlds, but because they seek to automate rather than learn from past mistakes. This is so, what can we do? Um, step number four is to use existing AI systems to diagnose current inequalities. So to keep um, the present open, to create more just and democratic worlds, 
we need to be a little perverse. We need to read the discriminatory results of these algorithms against the grain as evidence of past discrimination. So Amazon, for example, stopped using its secret hiring AI a few years ago because it was shown to discriminate against women. Right? So if you had women anywhere in your CV, women's chess club, women's university, you lost points. Um, but rather than simply discarding these programs, what if we use them as evidence? So a lot of Amazon hiring decisions were used to train this program. So what if rather than simply ditch this program, we thank them for meticulously documenting their discrimination? Think again of Compass. Compass presumes that racism stems from individual bias, that racism is an individual problem. Um, and as many of you um, probably know, sentencing varies with a judge's uh, circadian rhythms. Um, so you're much more likely to get a harsher sentence if you go before lunch when a judge is hungry than if you go after lunch. Um, so Compass made things more consistent it got rid of individual biases and idiosyncrasies, but by replacing them with institutional biases, which means to read against the grain, right? to be perverse and to read against the grain, what Compass actually shows is that racism is, racism is an institutional rather than simply an individual problem. Right? Compass shows that institutional racism exists. So what if we use these programs with all their limitations as historical tools, as theoretical probes? What if we treated them, in other words, like global climate change models? Right? So global climate change models show us a likely future based on the past, not so that we'll accept that future, but so we'll seek to change it. And truth and validation in global climate change models aren't the same thing. The point isn't to determine how accurate any given prediction is, but to act in such a way that we don't have to verify these predictions. The point is not to produce this graph. When a model shows a 2% increase in mean temperature, we should seek and we do seek to fix the world, not the model. Unless of course, we're a global climate change denier, which raises the question, do we really need more models? For whom is global climate change news? Which brings me to step five, the ultimate goal, which is to create different worlds, different algorithms, different relations by engaging the richness of relations and knowledge unfolding around us. To do so, it takes up Kara Keeling's call to listen with others for the poetry, the refrains, and the noise a world is making. And in the book, I argue that not only the problems, but the outlines of solutions can emerge from in there. Not because technology lies outside of culture, not because technology can solve cultural political problems, but because technology, culture, and politics are always fused together. Um, so for example, rather than foregoing correlation, I call on us to engage the richness of correlation. So correlation is correlation. Correlation is complicated. It's not simply a linear one-to-one -one relation. Correlation condenses, it dis displaces, it multiplies. Proxies both poison and cure. And um, this is something that Boaz um, Levin um, and Hito Sterl and um, others have been working on through, Vera Tolman have been working on through their proxy politics project. And as the terms condenses and displaces make clear, correlation ties analysis, data analysis to psychoanalysis. So foundational psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan himself argued for the primacy of correlation and its anticipatory nature. 
Um, the language of latent and manifest functions, which drives model-based recommender systems in data analysis more generally, um, was initially inspired by Freudian analysis, as well as open goals of social engineering. So if, as preeminent network scientist Barabasi has argued, you may want to get a degree in computer science if you want to understand what humans do and why they do it, it's in part because of, rather than despite the resonances between them. So in the book, I describe data analysis as the bastard child of psychoanalysis and eugenics. And I argue that this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Illegitimate offspring, as Donna Haraway has argued, are often unfaithful to their parents. Also drawing from work in African-American studies, indigenous and decolonial studies, Asian-American studies and queer theory, I emphasize that what we need are systems that engage the complexities of the past. Our current archives can never serve as ground truth because they're limited and biased. As Sadia Hartman and Ariella Azulai have argued, historical archives exclude and buttress a logic of world-destroying progress. But the past history, Azulai insists, is not lost, but rather a space of potential if only we can unlearn progress and engage with those who've been relegated to the past as potential companions. And the book revisits and emphasizes the populations that lie at the heart of our networks and defaults. Residents of Addison Terrace, Japanese internment camps, married student housing at MIT, civil rights activists, slaves, unruly women workers at Western Electric, housewives in Decatur, punishment averse mice, to name a few. So to return briefly to the housing study that coined the term homophily, the Columbia Bureau of Applied Sociological Research, which was led by Robert K. Merton and Carl Lazarsfeld, conducted a study of two public, uh, two housing projects. It analyzed um, friendship patterns within two projects. Crafttown, which was a cooperative project of some 700 white families in New Jersey, and Hilltown, a biracial low rent project of about 800 families in Western Pennsylvania. And they didn't assume homophily to be axiomatic, but rather asked what are the dynamic processes through which similarity or opposition of values shape the formation, maintenance, and disruption of close friendships. And they noted that in these communities, status homophily wasn't the norm, with the exception of gender and race. And they hypothesized that status homoph that they hypothesized that status homophily was actually due to value homophily, so the sharing of values. And to prove this, they concentrated on the overselection of white liberals and white illiberals as friends. Where friend equals one of your three closest friends and where liberal means that you support biracial housing and believe that folk in Hilltown get along, illiberal means the opposite. And you're ambivalent if you don't think housing should be biracial, but you acknowledge that the races get along in Hilltown. Now to make this point, they threw out the responses of the black residents because they said there were too few black residents with illiberal or ambivalent friends. And further in their subsequent analysis and model of friendship formation, which was key to value homophily, they ignored the white ambivalence. And the white ambivalence were actually the largest category of white residents. Um, further, they never published this data. And as they said in this footnote, um, had we seen the data, we would have seen that the overselection of illiberals in real terms was not statistically significant. Um, and in the report that was written by Marie Yehoda, Patricia West, and Robert K. Merton, they 
they say this directly. Um, their survey also acknowledged that residents did have friends and acquaintances of the other race. Now, what's clear is that although the black residents weren't counted, they were central, right? Without them, there could be no liberal or illiberal white connections. So these black residents lie within these spaces that make network connections possible. And the history of networks is filled with sociological studies of others, of racial others um, who ground network concepts and make connections possible even as they're made to disappear. So Japanese Americans, for example, who were interned in camps during World War II. So in the United States and Canada, um, all Japanese and Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians living on the West Coast during World War II were sent to camps in the interior. Um, notably, Canada and the US did not do the same for German or Italians or German uh, or Italian descended um, citizens. Studying these camps um, was central to the development of sentiment analysis and techniques for managing people in occupied territories. Um, these um, camps were the object of study of the Bureau of Sociological Research, which preceded Burton and Lazarsfeld's um, research group. Um, and this study, The Governing of Men, which looked at um, an uprising within Poston, which was one of the um, internment camps, was cited in the Lazarsfeld and Merton housing uh, study. So these populations, these connections are still there. They inhabit correlation, homophily, segregation, recognition, discrimination, proxies, and authenticity. They reside with us. And they touch us whenever we think with or through these concepts. So the question before us is, how might we reside with them? How might we reside with them? Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, uh, for, for your words, for your wisdom, or um, as Lorena put it after seeing the recording, the, the poetry, the poetic way of talking about a very, very um, complex issue. Um, we now have the opportunity to talk to you live uh, and ask some, some questions. Um, Oh, oh yeah, I forgot to uh, introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Tembi, I'm the co-moderator and I'm still having wearing an afro and a pink shirt. Uh, yeah, we now have um, uh, a few minutes to, to talk to you, to ask questions. Uh, as in the previous sessions, um, if you join us online, uh, you can send your questions to the number that should be shown to you in the stream right now. And if you're in the room, you can just approach the mic and um, ask your questions there. Um, Wendy, in your, in your keynote, you talked about truth, uh, and I think the sentence was uh, reducing truth to consistent repetition forecloses the present, past, and future. Uh, or what, what stuck with me as a non-tech person was the um, truth equals deepfake. Um, I wonder if you allow me to ask maybe a, a bit of a naive question. Is it, is it even possible or is it impossible to capture truth uh, in data and models? Um, thank you for that excellent question. So I think that um, part of the, the thinking behind um, the limitations of truth as consistent repetition comes from Hannah Arendt's work on totalitarianism in which she argues that what totalitarianism does is reduce truth to consistent repetition. 
Um, and so, and um, that, I have some problems with that formulation because it's unclear that that is actually what totalitarianism does, but she, she talks about it in terms of a certain um, logical approach to truth, which um, she links with um, mathematics um, and modeling. And what I find so key about that and thinking through that is that yes, absolutely in terms of learning or in terms of how these systems are validated um, internally, um, truth is reduced to repetition and it, it's blatant. It said, you know, this is right or true if it repeats. Um, this is the language they use. But at the same time, within the larger scope of, of science, when people talk about truth, again, in terms of global climate change models, for example, what we're talking about is not validation. Um, you, if you believe these models are true, you act in such a way that the results aren't validated. So even within the rubric of science, there is um, this tension between what's correct and what's true. And I think that um, what's so important about holding on to that tension is, as you pointed out, that these models are very limited and so can't get to something um, that we call um, or we understand to be true. But at the same time, they're central to our search for something that's true, if only because um, they show us um, negative versions of the world. And so I think that that role is absolutely key. Thanks so much. Um, it's me back again, and the co-moderator, Lorena. I see we have still not questions from, from the online um, audience, but also not from here on site. I am a Spanish dark-haired woman with a long dress. Um, it, it was amazing. Thanks so much for, for your talk. You quote there, um, Azule, to talk about the past and its changing nature. What is the nature of data and models in contrast to the language and the poetry with which people create past and futures? What's the difference? So what's so important about Ariela Azulay's um, notion of potential history is that she argues that um, the past is not past. Um, so we should move away from the notion that there is a past, a present, and a future, um, but, and that these are linearly related, but rather to think through the ways in which um, the past still exists. Um, within this space of potential. So she talks about going to the archive and looking at these uh, photographs and reading these stories, and rather than viewing them as primary sources um, from which analysis can be extracted, thinking through them as potential companions. Um, so refusing this notion of linear time. And clearly this notion of linear time or what uh, Walter Benjamin has called um, homogeneous empty time, the time of the graph, is central to the temporality of these models. Where the idea is, especially if you think through um, correlation, um, figuring out what doesn't change between past, present, and future in order to um, create different kinds of um, futures. So fundamentally part of listening to the poetry um, and, and the, that the worlds are making is to realize that these worlds aren't simply gone, um, that these worlds coexist with us. Um, and so that when we use a concept like correlation or we use sentiment analysis, it's not that these were extracted from certain communities like the Jap the, the Japanese Americans and um, Japanese and Japanese Canadians and Japanese that were in these internment camps, but rather that their experiences um, live on whenever we use these concepts. And so part of it is to say, um, what if we embrace that? Um, to give you another example that gets to some of this relationality, um, think through the ways in which uh, you get recommendations from a recommender system. Right? So what happens is that um, the systems um, often place you into certain neighborhoods with people who are, who are allegedly like you, which means what other people do fundamentally affect 
what you'll receive. Um, what that means is that how somebody acts um, affects you. So we're all related. Um, so what if we use that as the basis for political action or agency? What if we use that as to way, a way to say, yes, we're all connected, so my actions can provide shade for somebody else, that we can act collectively in certain ways um, to protect and enable one another. Um, and so what's interesting to me is that within um, recommender systems, within the technical um, description of them, um, agents are considered, like users are considered to be disingenuous, like acting disingenuously if they act collectively and intentionally. Um, so instead, th these systems have this model of this sort of unconscious um, user. This is why, you know, Netflix's The Social uh, Dilemma uh, docudrama showed us as little marionettes, right? And so this is the vision that's there, but it doesn't um, coincide with reality. It doesn't coincide with the ways in which we carefully create our identities online and the ways in which we're all connected in, in um, fundamentally productive ways. Uh, you talked about using that for good. Do you have an example of how, how that would, what it would look like, how that would be possible? Yes, yeah, so there's, um, in terms of, uh, let's think through something like facial recognition technology, um, what a group at, uh, sorry, I'm very distracted by it because I can also see myself on this big screen <laughs> and it's just very strange to be sort of talking to myself and seeing like, oh, I, I, I move my hands a lot. Sorry. Um, so <laughs> at uh, USC, there's a group that's um, affiliated with the Gina Davis Institute. Mm -hmm. And what they've been doing is using image processing technologies to actually analyze um, the history of Hollywood um, film and television. And then from that, look at um, gender representation to say, okay, so how many women are there? How, are they in speaking roles, et cetera? And so there's ways in which this um, technology can be used usefully in terms of past analysis um, in order to diagnose historical problems. Um, as well, you can think through some more speculative AI work done by um, people like Beth Coleman. Um, and she's been using Octavia Butler's science fiction as a way to think through and speculate uh, with and through machine learning. Um, clearly, the indigenous AI um, folk that you already have as part of your festival are absolutely fantastic in terms of the ways that they're um, rethinking um, AI. Are there questions from the audience? You just blew our minds away. There's been a lot of Twitter comments saying, oh, I'm in love with <laughs> Wendy Chun, and she's blowing my mind. So you're late. Oh, but we do have one question from the online world. My name is David, and as someone who works in machine learning in public health, what special responsibility of care in using ML uh, or artificial intelligence does the government have given its inherent power, and can it fulfill them? Absolutely, I, I think it can. I think that um, there are lots of people working on this in the policy world, um, people as, as such as yourself, um, and some people have taken the stand that um, machine learning should not be used um, predictively, that uh, given the problems uh, with the sort of deep fake past that are put in, one thing that um, public health authorities should not do is use these um, for, um, for prediction. Having said that, that doesn't mean that these shouldn't be used and can actually be used to understand historical patterns, as well as to understand um, biases that are put into the system. So um, recently there was a paper published um, with Momin Malik amongst many others who looked historically, who did a long um, analysis uh, of the COVID-19 um, data and its impact on historically unrepresented groups and argued that there should be reparations from slavery um, because of the ongoing health impacts. And so by doing this kind of data analysis, both uh, uh, in terms of what 
was previous to um, COVID and what is happening during the pandemic, they were able to make a statistical case for the enduring legacy of slavery on certain populations and therefore the need um, for reparations. I think also with public policy, there's huge debates over what uh, data should be made available um, and how. And I would have to say that the EU and in particular Germany have been doing, um, or are for, at the forefront of thinking through this. And what's so important about what Germany and the EU is doing is that they're moving away from simply understanding it in terms of privacy, um, but rather talking about it in terms of um, um, not only access to information, but the, um, the, uh, the importance that you should have in terms of shaping the types of information that's avail available for you. If there's no question in the room, we don't have any more online. Um, in your keynote, you said that um, data may be or will become uh, the new oil. And I was wondering, because um, in terms of oil, we haven't really managed um, as humankind to, to democratize democratize it to find an ethical way of handling it uh, and I was wondering if that's kind of what's uh, going to happen to data as well is there um, is there still hope that we can handle that resource more ethically yeah I think that when people like the economists say data is the new oil what's so great about that is that brings out the fact okay well oil's polluting um, oil has lots of problems and so um, it's not simply uh, something to be celebrated as the new resource. And I think um, Kate Crawford and others have done such a great job of showing um, the natural um, resources and the, uh, the cost to them that are involved in the whole process of what seems to be, quote unquote, simply clean data. Um, but I wonder, in, and this is what I think is so important, is for us to move away from notions of simply data as resource um, so again, something that's extracted from certain people um, and then can be used and manipulated. Um, and try again to fit, fundamentally rethink what it means for us to be networked. Um, because first of all, in terms of data and data extraction, it's not clear um, that data A should be stored. So in this sense, I think the whole idea of the right to be forgotten, which is so key uh, um, to certain EU legislation, right? So you have the right to be forgotten, therefore the right to delete data um, is good, but not enough um, because there should be a right not to be recorded to begin with. Um, but we, we have this sort of bizarre desire to store everything is, is part of what is destroying our planet. Um, I mean, there's this bizarre notion that if you put it into the cloud, somehow you're being environmentally friendly because you're not printing it off, right? So, so this is environmentally friendly, like books, print things off, I mean, and then delete is bizarrely more environmentally friendly than put everything into this cloud so it can be like um, stored and regenerated over and over and over again. So I think we need to fundamentally rethink things and also, again, to rethink what and how our relations happen. So to give you another example of what I think we can do, um, I would say is instead of thinking simply about privacy, um, we think about publicity. So what's really strange in a lot of um, laws in countries is that once you're a public figure, um, you're viewed to have absolutely no rights, um, that you can be exposed, et cetera, that you lose your rights as soon as you become a public figure. But if you think about it, on the internet, we've all become public figures. Um, and so what's absolutely key is to think through how, what does it mean to be in public? And how can we be in public, be vulnerable and exposed and not attacked? Um, how can everyone have the right to loiter online? Because often, um, if you go back to revenge porn, what was, what was told to these women who were harassed was, well, get off the internet, you know? If you, you don't have to be on the internet, get off. Um, and that isn't, doesn't, um, that is, is from a certain notion of privacy. Um, and importantly, privacy law, especially within the United States, is 
um, incredibly raced and gendered. So New York State's first privacy law was based on this, um, the case of Abigail Roberts. And Abigail Roberts was a white woman whose image was used um, unbeknownst to her to sell flour. Um, and this was considered an outrage and um, it became a, a story of how can you own your image? Well, at the same time that this was happening, Nancy Green um, uh, became the face of Aunt Jemima um, and her image was used to sell flour. Um, and yet there was never a sense that this African-American woman had a right to her own image. Right? So again, we need to think through how to protect public, being in public um, and uh, decouple it from certain notions of ownership. We have one more question, but I think we're approaching. <laughs> we're, we're running out of time. This yes. is a very German, um, <laughs> very strict, um, but also very relational timekeeping because, of course, our colleagues at 60, uh, at 6.30 have to, st have to start exactly at mm. 6.30, otherwise they cannot use the room. This has been such a treat. Yes, thank you so much, Wendy, for, um, for being with us and for your incredible keynote. We're looking forward to reading your book, all of you, uh, us here, I think. Um, we now uh, have the opportunity to join two very special artistic interventions, um, an intervention and a workshop. Um, Perhaps we would give a short round of applause for oh, Wendy, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for her time, for her wisdom and her thoughts. Thank you so, so much. Yes. Has been a real pleasure. Yes, um, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, Yes, we will have the opportunity to join the um, Erotics of Extractivism call center again. Uh, you can try your lock to call or you follow the installation online. And if you are registered for our afternoon workshop, uh, you have the opportunity to join a very special happening, the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies. If you haven't registered yet, um, you're lucky too because there's some few spots left um, and you can spend your afternoon um, trying to foresee a future where technologies are designed by people who are too often excluded from or targeted by technology today. Um, so that's a wrap up for today. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the choice to decide. I, can, I kind of think that you can do both if you want to. Um, and for tomorrow, we have the last day of the conference to a fabulous string of sessions. Did you ever want to contribute to curate a museum? Yes, you can do this tomorrow here at Camp Nagel with the brilliant matronage of Museum Mummy, a museum in and not only of the future. Please make sure to book today in advance if you want to join on site. For all our online audience, do not worry, we got you and you will be able to follow up on a hybrid panel where you can ask questions to your descendants. How is it to live in a world in which racist patriarchy does not exist anymore or what values persist? Who rules? Which deck is most prominent? Does the internet still exist? All those questions you can ask tomorrow at the panel, starting at um, 12 o'clock in the morning. For all others, please make sure to book online so that you can join on site. And we will then have a still conversation with one of the two shining stars in the world of the Marvel comics and African futurism, the writer Nadia Crawford and their renowned scholar Kate Crawford, who has been mentioned a lot this day and uh, talk about her new book, The Atlas of AI. And now over to our brilliant co-curators and co-moderators from Museum Mummy and Coding Rights. Thanks so much.